Dave Allen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I say welcome to St. Augustine's. Uh, you know the procedure, so would you just please prepare yourselves? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 98, 99, 100, coming, ready or not? Oh, you. Morning, Charlie. Hi, Harry. Uh, Mrs. Clancy. Mrs. Clancy. Hi, number five. Clancy. You shouldn't have any trouble identifying the body, Mrs. Clancy. <laughs> <laughs> well? I don't think so. Do you have any more? <laughs> oh, Lord. I beseech thee in my hour of need as a minister of the one and only true faith to answer these my prayers. O oh Lord, your church lives in troubled times. Everywhere in the name of our Lord of Jefferson, the merciful, praise be to our Lord of the world, the Pernifferson, the merciful, owner of the name of Jefferson, scatter the Lord our God of your faith, Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Welcome to the show. And may I say, your very good health. Cheers. It's extraordinary, in a way. It's very illogical, actually, when you pick up something which is purely alcohol <laughs> and say to somebody, good health. <laughs> when you actually think of the properties of alcohol, the damage it does to you, it, de it destroys your brain cells. Gives you enormous headaches, double vision, DTs, <laughs> destroys your stomach lining, your bladder, your kidney, your liver. And we say, good health. <laughs> we say, cheers, good health, long life, <laughs> happiness. We should be actually saying, misery. Short life, bad health. It's very odd, that, actually, isn't it? I mean, we don't actually pick up anything that's healthy. We never tell to toast somebody with, with a glass of water or a cup of tea. I mean, if you're in a bar, you look across and you go... <laughs> you're in a cafe with a cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> Another thing that the Irish actually are accused throughout the world have been perhaps the most illogical nation in the world. Now, I don't actually think that we are illogical. I think that we are a, a nation of what would be termed lateral thinkers. <laughs> I don't mean we lie down and think about it. <laughs> but we approach subjects in a different way. For example, I guarantee you, if, if, if you go to Ireland and ask for directions from an Irish person, nine out of ten people will advise you not to start from where you are. <laughs> just a different approach. They'd say, I, I wouldn't start from here if I were you. Go over there, it's nearer. <laughs> I actually saw, I'd been out of Ireland for a while, and I went back and I was in a restaurant, and on the menu, it said goose. Now, I, I haven't seen goose on a menu for years. So I said, I said to the waitress, I said, how's the goose? She said, I don't know, I didn't ask him. <laughs> 
Oh, I said, no, no, what's it like? She says, it's like a white duck, only bigger. <laughs> And the English, the English actually considered the Irish to be a very strange nation. Anyway, you get an Irishman who applies at a building site for a job. And the Englishman said, London, whoa, darling. Ah, uh, we're going to have to give you an intelligence test, aren't we? The extraordinary thing about the English, they always ask you questions. I went down the road, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had a cup of tea, don't I? I don't bloody know. What's he asking me for? <laughs> We're going to give you an intelligence test, all right? And the Irishman said, yes, of course, all right. He said, all right, darling. What's the difference between a girder and a joist? And the Irishman said, well, that's, that's simple. Girder wrote Faust and Joyce wrote Ulysses. <laughs> if you want to actually examine what is termed Irish illogicality, perhaps the best place in the world to go to is the courts. I watched the man in an Irish court, and the judge said to him, he's charged with some menial offence, and the judge said to him, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? And he said, would you mind awfully if I listen to the evidence? <laughs> I saw a judge who said, I've reached a decision, and the verdict I pass upon you, the defendant, is one year in prison and a 500 pound fine. And the counsel for defense stood up and he said, my lord, I'd like you to reverse that decision. He said, fine, 500 years in jail. <laughs> there, is a, there is a word in the English language, which is called a malaprop. It was created by an Irish writer called Sheridan in a play called The Rivals. It's his ability to mix up your words, to get similar sounding words and get them out of context. It's like saying, I'm living on subsidence. <laughs> uh, or I can't see through the, through the window because of the compensation. <laughs> I've actually heard male Jewish children have an operation to the Gentiles. <laughs> a woman could not have a child because she was impregnable. <laughs> Inconceivable or unbearable. And I saw a fellow in court, a young fellow in court, standing in the dock in Dublin. And he's got his, both his hands in his trouser pockets. And he's chewing gum very noisily, right throughout the whole proceeding. And eventually the judge lands across the bench and he said, Young sir, would you kindly stop masticating? <laughs> and he said, I'm sorry, my lord. And he took his hands out of his pockets. a man who had been charged with some sort of sexual offence and he's under oath and he's giving under oath his evidence and he's swearing under oath that he could not have committed the said sexual offence because at the time of that said sexual offence he was suffering from the dreaded Venetian disease <laughs> <laughs> and his counsel stood up and said my lord I think my client meant to say he had a touch of the gondoliers <laughs> Well, the English, they actually, they, they pride themselves on the logic. They look on the Irish as a totally kind of lunatic nation of people. Well, I was reading recently where London Transport have lost, last year, 40 million in unpaid fares. And I thought to myself, well, if they applied Irish logic to that, they could, they could save themselves a lot of money. All they have to do is to cut the fares in half, and they'd save themselves 20 million. <laughs> quite sure about that. Right? <laughs> I mean, I find it extraordinary in this day and age. When you say a working man, he spends his life, he gets up every morning to the clock. He clocks in to the clock. He leaves work to the clock. He comes home. He goes to bed to the clock to get up, to go to work to the clock. And he spends his whole working life doing that. And when he retires, what do they do? 
to give him a bloody retirement club. Now he's got nothing to do and he's got a clock to look at that time and burn it. Within the logicality of, of, of England, if I, for example, working on the assumption someday we'll have a nice hot summer, <laughs> go into my garden, and I like the sun, and I decide to strip naked and lie in my garden naked. And my next door neighbor, female, looks out of her window and sees my nakedness. <laughs> she can actually see my genitals. <laughs> Private! Oh my God, what a word! Private! <laughs> she can actually phone the police and have me arrested for indecent exposure. Now, can you imagine that happening to you? you your career is wiped out. Your, the company that hired... My God, I didn't know he was like that. <laughs> your wife will wander around, the neighbors will say, Oh, poor darling, my God, imagine being married to a beast like that. <laughs> Your children will get harassed in school. All the kids, yeah, Dad, it's a flash, yeah, no. <laughs> and yet if she goes into her garden and lies naked in the sun, and I look at her nakedness, she can phone the police and have me arrested for being a peeping Tom. <laughs> I've, been, I've actually been prattling on for a long time, a bit too long time. I think it's time, actually, that uh, I did a little bit more damage to my health. And while I'm damaging my health, you can watch some sketches. <laughs> Let it be known to all within this parish that whereas these two females no. away a long time. have been found guilty of the heinous an unchristian sin of gossip. Yeah. It has been pronounced by the elders that in accordance with our Christian laws, they shall suffer the prescribed punishment, to wit, to be ducked and held beneath the water until they learn to mend their ways. Let the punishment commence. you are ordained members of the Trappist faith, you must remember your three solemn vows, the vow of celibacy, the vow of poverty, and the vow of silence. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Oh, my mother was right about you. Six mad Irish get. those fools with a bomb. They've destroyed our world. I didn't believe anybody could be so stupid. Well, what did you expect them to do? We were being threatened with annihilation. Well, what did you expect them to do? Turn over on their backs, play dead? You're not coming out with that peace through strength argument, are you? You're bloody right I am. If we hadn't had Cruz and Polaris, they would have attacked years ago. It was that deterrent that kept them at bay. I don't believe it. It was a bloody deterrent that made them attack us in the first place, you cretins. Cret. Yes, cret. Who are you calling it? I'm calling you a cret. I expect you were one of those CND supporters, don't weren't you? Let me write I wasn't. Don't bloody vote me. <laughs> <laughs> Men. <laughs> the English 
British are the most illogical nation in the world. You surround yourself with statisticians, people who actually work out statistically. I read recently, a statistician has worked out that if the Chinese nation, now that they've reached 1,000 million, decided to walk around the world in rows 12 deep, it would take me 52 years of my life to count them as they went by my front door. <laughs> now, I don't think the Chinese are that stupid. I don't think the whole of the Chinese nation is one day going to stand up and go, Oh, I go for a walk around the world. You come. <laughs> I mean, I read these extraordinary statistics. I read recently where somebody has worked out that 66 tons of dog excrement is excreted out under the streets of Britain. Now, I'm totally against that, anyhow. But I mean, how, how do they get these figures? I mean, can you imagine paying money to educate your child? And he goes on to university and he takes degrees and he's now the greatest expert in the country on dog crap. <laughs> he spends all his days wandering around the streets with little rulers and measures. <laughs> and you're guided. You're guided by the most illogical notices in the world. For example, in this theater here tonight, the audience that are here are informed by the management that when you leave here, you must leave by the exits only. <laughs> now, I'm Irish. I don't have to be told that. <laughs> There's solid wall gap. <laughs> I go for the gap. <clears throat> I live near a graveyard which actually has a sign which says, Do not use the footpath to the crematorium. It is for patrons only. <laughs> I love things when I see a door which says, this door is not an exit. <laughs> this door is not an exit. I've actually seen it in Manchester. I was walking up a laneway. On the outside of a door, <clears throat> it actually says, this door is neither an exit nor an entrance. <laughs> and must be kept closed at all times. Why not just break the bloody thing up and forget about it? <laughs> now that, hang on. That is on the outside of the door. So that means you've got to go into the building. Come through the door. Go outside and you see, oh shit, I'm not allowed out there. I better go back. <laughs> I mean, I love it when I see things like part-time females required. <laughs> Who's a part-time female? I saw a notice recently which says, Are you illiterate? <laughs> Are you unable to read and write? <laughs> if so, contact us at this address. <laughs> I mean, I go through Soho and I see it which says, Live girls dancing. <laughs> what do you expect? Stiffs on a piece of elastic? <laughs> I've actually seen by the River Thames a sign which says, This area is liable to flooding. <laughs> if this notice is covered, do not park your car. <laughs> My, my favorite, actually, is I've seen, have your ears pierced while you wait. <laughs> what else are you going to do? Take them off. I'll be back. <laughs> now, when we get to the illogicality of any situation, why don't you think the English, for some reason or another, seem to believe that they impart knowledge and information and understanding through Proverbs, they speak in proverbial forms. They, they say, parents will say to children things like, never cross your bridge until you come to it. <laughs> Believe me, there is a proverb in the English language which actually states, learn to cut your fingernails with your left hand, one day you might lose your right arm.
I mean, they're, they're amazing, the, the English. I mean, they really are with your language. I mean, I was looking for a house, trying to buy a house a few years ago. And every house I went to, the people, generally the woman in the house, would show me around the house. And she'd say things, most obvious things. She'd say, this is the kitchen. <laughs> she'd show me, put a table and a stove and lots of plates. This is the kitchen. Into the la this is the lavatory. The cellar is downstairs. Oh. I mean, there's that lovely thing. Have you, ever, have you ever sat in a bar at a table, two or three empty chairs around it? Somebody's bound to come up and say, are you, are you sitting in that chair? <laughs> no, I'm sitting in this one. No, well, what I mean, is there anybody sitting in that chair? Yes, there's eight people having a gangbang. <laughs> sat, say, in a park on a, on a newspaper, sit on the bench, it's wet, and you put a newspaper down, sit there, somebody will come along and sit beside I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, after five minutes or two minutes, they'll turn around and say, uh, I, are, you, are you reading that? <laughs> yes, I have an eye up my anus, I always... <laughs> I'm an English... When they meet somebody who doesn't actually speak English very well, they don't ever work it out and reason it out that the person does not speak English very well. They, they work on the premise, he's deaf. <laughs> go get a German or something like that. You, you want to go where? Well, then you go, go down, down the road. Down! Down the go down the road! Down the road! <laughs> Bloody Poland, didn't you? <laughs> I think it's uh, I think it's time that we have a, another sketch, isn't it? I'm afraid there's no doubt at all, Mrs. Kravitz. Oh. We felt that as his wife, maybe you would want to tell him. Yes, I understand. If you rather. No, 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 I'll do it. Very well. Just two minutes then. Henry. It's me, Joan. <laughs> Darling, it's me. I brought you some flowers. Where shall I put them? What, in the vase? Darling, the, um, I've just spoken to the doctor. The hospital, they've, they've run some tests on you. God, I don't know how I'm going to break this to you. The hospital say it's almost certain that you're a glove puppet. <laughs> oh, I know this is a terrible shock. I, I could ask for a second opinion, but I, I think that deep down we've both known it all along. Mary! <laughs> the answer. That never was the answer to any of our problems. Oh, darling. Here. Come on. No. <laughs> there. there, that's better. Henry, we've always promised each other that we wouldn't have any secrets, haven't we? And it's not working out for us, is it? Darling, it's my fault as much as yours. It's just that I'm, well, I'm not a glove puppet. And darling, I've got something to tell you. I've met someone. He's, he's very like you, really, only taller. <laughs> it's not that he's anything very special. It's just that he and I are alike, in a, in a way. We're neither of us glove puppets. Darling, don't make this difficult for me. Things are better for both of us this way. Darling, you and I, we have no future together. You'll come to see that in time. I'm sorry. I must be going. So this is our, our last goodbye. May I kiss you? Oh, Henry, I'll never forget you.
taking that very serious out there, aren't you? Little <laughs> teddy bear. It would appear that the, uh, the theme of this show is communication, or the lack of it, as the case may be. Somebody sent me a CSE examination paper, which I'd like to read to you, if I may. It's one of the questions. Uh, it's question five, CSE, mathematics paper. In a youth club, 25 girls are 17 years old, 31 girls wear miniskirts, and 23 like country dancing. There are nine who are both 17 years old and wear miniskirts. Seven wear miniskirts and like country dancing, and four girls are 17 years old and like country dancing. There are two girls who are 17 years old, wear miniskirts, and like country dancing as well. How many girls are in the club? <laughs> I'll, I'll work it out. You, uh, you watch some sketches. Thomas or Beckett? I am he. We are here on the king's business. a shock, Mrs. O'Hara. speaking, this represents the continuum of Anglican orthodoxy, which we embrace within the litany and indeed the liturgical canon of the term ultra canonis.
have to ask you if either of you is prepared to apologize and offer the other party a retraction. Uh, you, Your Grace? Certainly not. Uh, my lord? No, no. I see. Very well. Have you chosen your weapons? We have. Is it to be pistols or swords? Every stupid man. It's, it's these delightful young girls. Uh, <laughs> feel to understand. For a doctor, you're not very bright, perfectly obvious. The first man who dies of excitement <laughs> loses the duel. I see. <clears throat> well, this is damned irregular. Uh, uh, however... Do, do get on with it. Yes, my lord. However, we shall commence. And now you know the rules. Eight paces, retire. Are you ready, gentlemen? Disgusting, pitiful creatures to die for a moment of lustful pleasure. Serves them right. Somebody clear these miserable carcasses away. that nowadays, whatever you do, say, or wear, somebody's trying to analyze psychologically what the whole hidden meaning or hidden message is behind it all. Scientists tell us that something like 35% of all communication is made in words. The rest of it is made up in the way we dress, the sounds that we make, the hand gestures that we make, and what we call body language. For example, we we're told that we, we tell a great deal about ourselves and our inner selves by the colors that we wear. For example, people who wear yellow are basically depressed. <laughs> and they're trying to brighten themselves up by wearing yellow. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll wear yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and they know inwardly that yellow doesn't suit them so they become even more depressed <laughs> than they were before they put the yellow on <clears throat> i mean <clears throat> brown we are told if you wear brown you're you're insecure you're shy you need lots of confidence building gray we're told if we wear gray that we're we're wearing grey because we don't want people to know what we're really, what we're really like. It's a kind of nondescript colour. Well, I'm wearing grey. Blue. You wear blue, you're, you're calm. Not easy. See Mrs. Thatcher in the House of Parliament? <laughs> calm and easy. Right, I am a gentleman! <laughs> Untouched, virginal. Why do nuns wear black? <laughs> Red. Red, as far as women are concerned, is sexually aggressive. That's what they're actually saying. They come into a room and they're actually saying, This is my body! <laughs> it's mine and I'm proud of it! And it does wonderful things. <laughs> Look at it. Look at it. And it's going to take yours and gobble it up in a moment. <laughs> and in a week, she's wearing black, saying he couldn't take it. <laughs> My 
out. We're told that red, red, black, and white, extremely aggressive. I mean, look. <laughs> I'm wearing black, I'm wearing white, I'm wearing gray, I'm wearing blue, I'm calm, I'm virginal, <laughs> slightly aggressive. <laughs> I don't know what I'm mourning, but I think I know. <laughs> there's also, when we talk about communication, there's, there's the body language. It's, it's become now, in a sense, a science. You know, that people actually believe in, in what the body language. There's all sorts of gestures, messages we send through, through our body. We, we'll be sitting very still, but our body is sending all sorts of messages. For example, <clears throat> if I do do things like this. That means I'm pleased with myself. Huh. Oh. I'm pleased with I'm smug little bastard. I'm smug. <laughs> and I get to folding the arms. Folding the arms is, in a sense, telling you or other people to back off. I don't really want contact with you. This is my territory. Stay out, okay? I'm building barriers, so push off. This, the legs. When I do that, I'm guarding the genitalia. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I really don't want anything to do with you whatsoever, okay? <laughs> And if I do this as well, I'm really telling you, push up. You're not gonna screw me. <laughs> Open hands. We do things like that. Now, listen to me. Please, now listen to me. I'm being totally honest. Let's open hands. Open just see with your legs open. See? It means that you're sexually available. <laughs> in the front row have gone. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what it's saying. Honestly, I'm sexually available. And when you, when you do things like, when you're sitting in a chair and your legs are, and you're, you just kind of, you kind of point him with your foot. You're inadvertently sending out messages to the person that you'd like, like to have sex with. I'm, I'm sexually, I'm sexually available. Cameraman, I'm not talking to the camera. I'm talking to the fellow behind him. <clears throat> there's also there's all sorts of signs. I mean, when you actually think of of gestures, aggressive gestures. Have you ever noticed that there's no aggressive gestures that are down? Have you notice that? They're all up, aren't they? I mean that. That's an aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> You never do. <laughs> Maybe you're in a car and something. Ah, you wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't mean it. You gotta go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those signs are all up. Like <laughs> somebody behind you in the car blowing a horn. <laughs> you gotta. You get a mirror. And you're like, <laughs> you, that one. You wouldn't put your hand out the window and go. <laughs> then, in fact, I mean, there are things we're not supposed to do. Natural. Your body behaves in a natural way. Yawning, for example. I mean, you yawn. When you yawn, what actually happens is your body is taking in more oxygen. But somebody, somewhere along the line, has applied what they would call rules, good manners. You never yawn. You never yawn. Eh, eh, eh. <laughs> Parents, don't do that. Don't do Stop that. Cover your mouth up. So when you, you have a yawn, you're in, you want to yawn, you go, you know, I see them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You ever 
seen people say, Ew. You can break your jaw. But in your own house, in the privacy of your own house, when you, when you actually wake up in the morning, don't you yawn? And it's beautiful. You don't sit in bed when you wake up in the morning. Clang, 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 clang. You don't go. You, you, you go. Uh, 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 your wife, you Scratching. You, you get a scratch, you get itchy. You scratch, don't you? In your own household, you scratch. Good, it's lovely. Oh, it's great scratch. It's a warm, marvelous. Thing. Oh, it's, it's it's body contact. It's marvelous. You you actually get other members of your family to scratch you. Scratch, scratch, scratch. There, there. Down, 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 down. Oh. Up. Don't cover your mouth, yawn properly. <laughs> She's sitting out there going. Mm. <laughs> what do you do when you're talking about scratch? You actually get members of you, don't you? Have you ever got you? Scratch, there, there. Just down, down, there, down. Oh, oh. Oh, up, up, over, 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 over. <laughs> and yet in public, we're not allowed to scratch. We're not allowed to contact our bodies. Huh? find yourself going to talk to your bank manager, trying to borrow money in the middle of this discussion about rates and interest. You get a little itch. You, you won't go, excuse me. Um, I have an itch. <laughs> I'm about to scratch it, all right? There's nothing filthy or dirty or unclean. I happen to have an itch there. You, you, and that would be it, finish. You don't do that. You sit there, and, you <clears throat> and the itch begins to spread. <laughs> you get your hand in your pocket. <laughs> and if you have a yawn at the same time, you're having a fit. You're sitting there going. Mm. Mm. I think it's, uh, it actually looks like we've come to the end of the show. But I have one last item, and what a better way to introduce this last item than to say, once upon a time. Once upon a time, in a land far away, there lived a princess who never laughed. The king tried to make her laugh. The queen tried to make her laugh. Even her little dog tried to make her laugh. So the king, who loved his daughter dearly, sent messengers to every land in all the world. <laughs> and he made it known that he who could make the princess laugh would have the hand of his daughter in marriage. And in less time than it takes to tell, the funniest men in all the world were arriving at the royal palace. didn't even smile.
and more miserable. He sat and brooded in the palace and wouldn't speak to anyone. The whole kingdom was very unhappy. One day, the princess decided to go for a walk in the forest. She was sad. She didn't mean to make her father unhappy. It was just that she'd never seen anything that made her feel like laughing. Then suddenly, whilst walking, she saw a man. all the land. The princess has laughed. And in no time at all, the princess and the man she met in the woods were wed. The king was delighted. The queen was delighted. And the little dog was more than delighted. And every morning, the very first thing they heard was the sound of their daughter's laughter. And the princess and the flasher lived happily ever after.